Perfect. All right. Well, hey, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Levi Smith. I'm with Formlabs. Um, and we're going to be talking a little bit about which 3D printing materials should you choose with regards to uh, your applications, your workflows, what, what makes the most sense. And uh, obviously, I'll be presenting today with Lauren Aidy over at EAC. And again, really excited to kind of kick off this, uh, this presentation with y'all. So just a quick um, rundown on the agenda today. A couple of things I want to just tie off. A, what's trending in the additive world? Um, we'll also talk a little bit about, um, you know, who Formlabs is, who a EAC is, but in terms of the meat of the presentation, you know, we'll talk about the trends in additive. We'll talk about application material versatility. We'll do a real deep dive in terms of how people are using the range of materials that Formlabs has available. And then we'll really dive into some uh, production cases, some of the stuff in the work that we've done with Gillette and New Balance. We'll talk about our own production case around prototyping. You know, we'll do a deep dive on the Formlabs print farm. And then of course, obviously make sure we get some questions answered today. Um, so that's just a quick look at our agenda. And with that said, I was gonna bring uh, Lauren in to talk well, actually, you know what? We'll save that for one slide, Lauren. Um, just a couple of things I want you guys to walk away with today. Um, first and foremost, perspective on materials, versatility, and workflows, right? What SLA materials are going to best fit your needs for your applications? We'll talk a, a little bit about the possibility of scaling, with, uh, produ scaling to production with a desktop 3D printing solution versus a large frame solution. And then, of course, talk about EAC product development solutions, who they are, and you know how they can obviously help you in your additive manufacturing needs. So with that said, I was going to pass it over to Lauren. Awesome, thanks, Levi. Um, if you go to the next slide, I will read our mission statement and tell a little bit about the services that we offer. Um, so our mission at EAC is to transform the way that companies design, manufacture, connect to, and service their products. And we do that by offering solutions for product development. Uh, we're partnered with PPC to provide Creo CAD software and Windchill PLM software. Uh, we also provide training and implementation services for those as well. Uh, we are an engineering and design firm as well. So we help with backlog if you have extra projects that you can't get to. We are an ANSYS partner, um, so we provide the ANSYS software for advanced simulation needs. Uh, we also provide IoT, Internet of Things solutions to help get your products smartly connected. And then obviously the reason that we are on the call today, we're a commercial partner of Formlabs to be able to offer the affordable desktop 3D printing options to make it easier for companies like you to bring 3D printing in-house. So I'll turn it back over to you, Levi. Perfect. Thank you for that introduction, Lauren. And, uh, you know, just, just a quick kind of, um, you know, backdrop to EAC. EAC was one of our uh, first partners on board with Formlabs. Um, it's been a fantastic ride with them in terms of their perspective, their experience in the market has really helped us drive a better experience as well. So again, it's always great to be partnered with great partners. Um, so just a quick background on Formlabs, who we are. Um, you know, our goal is to expand access to digital fabrication so anyone can make anything. So it's really about expanding access to this technology. And we do this through two specific components. There's two things we're always thinking about, and that is how can we make our products easier to use? Little known fact about Formlabs, 44% of our users have little to no 3D printing experience. And that doesn't mean they don't have any experience with resin printers or SLA printers. That is across the board, FDM, SLA, binder jet, you know, and so our product's really easy to use um, and we're constantly thinking about how to do that. The second thing we're constantly thinking about is how do we make our products more versatile? And that's really what we're gonna drive into in this conversation today. So just a quick background on who Formlabs is. We originally started in 2012. Our founders uh, built the first Form 1 in their basement, uh, want to expand access to this terrific technology. So they put it up on Kickstarter, want to raise a couple hundred thousand dollars, and within the first 30 days, raised three million bucks, got 300 of those sold. And that's really where we found out that there's a market in place for this technology. And so, you know, it was a great start. Um, 2014, we launched the iteration on the Form 1, the Form 1 Plus. And the Form 2 in 2015 was a real game changer for us. We put about 50,000 of those or 40,000 of those machines out in the world in about five years. And just recently in April, we launched our Form 3 and Form 3L with our new proprietary technology, uh, low pore steel lithography. And just recently, we launched our Form 3B, which is for uh, biocompatible bio resin. So it's been a really exciting journey just in terms of the products we've come out with. Um, but again, 50,000 printers over that time. 40 million parts made, 
chasing a $22 billion market. So this market is growing like crazy, roughly fivefold year over year. And people are really starting to think about how this technology really works for them. How can it help them build a better product, a quicker product to market? And there's a lot of ex exciting things that we'll really drive into, but it's a very simple formula in terms of additive manufacturing. You know, and it all has to do with cost per part. As the cost per part drops, and this is just a small diagram from 2009 to now in terms of cost per part, but as the cost per part drops based on the cost of material, the cost of the machine, you really drive into a lot of the manufacturing workflows out there. So in 2010, you know, additive manufacturing was really tied to large frame, $100,000 machines, and really was uh, in the space of maybe, you know, aerospace, dental, very high-end customized applications. And as that cost per part drops, we really start to drive into some of the more standard manufacturing workflows out there. You know, right now we're really doing a lot of small production uh, plastic parts. Shoes, you know, is, is another big one in terms of customization and additive. You know, we'll dive into that with New Balance. And obviously dental is a big part here as well. So um, we'll really drive into this as we, as we talk through some of our uh, materials here. So just in terms of what's trending in additive, what was once just a prototyping product development tool is really starting to enter the world of manufacturing and production. There's two key areas of improvement here. Compact modular systems, what was once done on a uh, machine that was the size of your uh, basement is now done on a machine that sits on your desktop. And of course, the second is materials development, right? And, you know, the range of materials you have access to really increases the range of applications that you can use additive manufacturing with. And so we'll really drive into these two key areas of improvement um, as we walk through this presentation. The first area, of course, is, you know, modular pr production and what are the advantages, you know, in terms of a compact modular system. And, you know, kind of the, uh, the analogy we always like to kind of lean on is computing power. You know, what was really tied up in mainframes gave way to blade servers and additive manufacturing is really on that same journey. What once took a Volkswagen sized machine to print a part is now being done on your desktop. And there's a range of benefits there from redundancy to lean enablement, the ease and convenience of using a desktop solution versus a large frame solution. We'll dive into a couple of these here real quick. Um, the first one I like to always talk about is scalability, right? So the example we use here is uh, is data we pulled directly from our print farm. You know, and our print farm is pumping out about 20,000, roughly 18,000 plus sample parts a month. But, you know, this is the example we use in terms of scalability. So in terms of what you need to do as an initial capital investment, um, you know, the installation, all those things really play well with regards to scalability. So if you need to scale 1,250 units of production, uh, you'll see in this graph here what your demand is, which is the, the green bar there. And then this is desktop versus large format. So the initial cost to get to 12, 1,250 units of production versus large format versus desktop, and the amount of um, additive manufacturing power you have that's underutilized or not utilized as you scale to that. So again, uh, scalability is a crucial kind of lever with regards to thinking about production in a modular way. Um, lean enablement is another key component. Again, this is all data we pulled from our print farm that we built out over a two year period, but there's a range of benefits with regards to lean, lean enablement. And this is just a digital kind of a representation of our workflow at that print facility um, from, you know, in terms of what it brings to the table, operator specialization, you know, being able to dial in specific materials to specific machines as you scale multiple machines in that environment. Of course, no inventory due to batching, efficient scheduling, and you're really able to kind of balance uh, proper cycle time with regards to scaling with a production or a, a modular desktop solution. So these are just some of the benefits, and we'll actually dive into more of these as we talk about um, Form Labs Print Farm um, further down the presentation. So in terms of the second component, material development. So the versatility that you see in 3D printing these days has exponentially grown. The amount of workflows that are available has exponentially grown. And it really has to do with material development and the range of materials you have access to through various different technologies. And uh, just before I kind of dive into the, some of the specific resins we have available, you know, the, the, the thing I did want to kind of touch on is the R&D over at Form Labs. There's three groups of R&D here. The first, of course, are the MEs building the new machines in terms of the Form 3 and the Form 3L. 
You have the group that is building out our optimize or optimizing our software in terms of preform and how to orient parts to print them. The last group and the real rock stars over here at Form Labs is our material scientists and our materials team. This team is really one of a kind. Um, in terms of polymer science, it's such a boutique science that we have to pluck these uh, these folks straight out of uh, universities and put them into our program. 75% of them have PhDs. And what they cook up in that kitchen, that materials kitchen, is really something special. So over at Form Labs, you know, the, the second thing I touched on was material versatility. And at Form Labs, we've developed over 20 plus resins to you know, help in those workflows to, to develop the thing that you want to create. So just a quick rundown, you know, these are some of our higher in, higher end engineering resins from Tough Resin, which people use for snap fits, jigs and fixtures. Uh, Gray Pro is one of our our more popular resins with regards to just straight prototyping uh, applications for you know fit, form, and function. Rigid is actually one of my favorite uh, resins out there. Rigid is a glass filled or a silica based glass filled resin. It's great for thin walled parts. So think about little uh, gear boxes that you need to make. It, it has great tolerances. So a lot of people are starting to use it for thermal forming applications. High temp, we're really going to drive into in, in terms of some of our case studies today, but people are using it for micro injection workflows, manifolds, any high temp application out there. And then of course, elastic is really one of our fastest growing resins. A lot of people use it for compliance features, gaskets, seals. It's got great energy return and of course, tear strength. So this is just a quick snapshot of what material and what versatility, you know, our product kind of brings to the table here. Um, but with that said, I want to dive into some specific workflows around these resins and what people are using them for. The first one I want to kind of talk about is one of our standard resins, our clear resin. You know, it's one of our more popular resins out there. A lot of people are using it for, for a range of different applications um, from microfluidics. One of the new, new ones that we're really seeing out there based on the new Form 3 um, machine and our clear resin is optical clarity and light pipes. So Lexicon Design is doing a lot of really cool stuff around light pipes with regards to um, the Form 3 and our clear resin. But again, really great with regards to microfluidics and any application that you need a prototype for optical clarity. Second to that, you know, another really interesting kind of uh, application we're starting to see, and you'll see this on our website with regards to the Volkswagen case study, is electroplating. So, you know, electroplating for aesthetic and functional prototyping. Over at Volkswagen, um, they really wanted to, you know, this is their Type 20 concept vehicle, and they wanted to prototype their iconic Volkswagen um, image into a, the, the organic kind of spokes that you see on the, uh, on the wheel there. So this, that the uh, center component of that wheel is actually uh, 3D printed uh, in our standard clear resin and then electroplated. And there's a lot of uh, great benefits in terms of functional prototyping there. Again, uh, a lot of the um, you know, resistance to deformation over time is exponentially increased based on electroplating. Um, but again, with Volkswagen, they wanted to capture that iconic Volkswagen image with that, that specific detail, but still get the functional properties they needed to put it on that Type 20 concept vehicle. And we're starting to see this application really expand, right? You know, a lot of people are starting to really work on the aesthetics of their design. So this is just a, uh, uh, a design firm out of Chicago that does a lot of design work with Kohler. Um, they've seen actually a 20% uptick on their uh, design services because they just started electroplating uh, the parts that they would present to Kohler uh, in terms of their design work. They, they've had a monster increase in their business just based on prototyping um, and, and electroplating their specific parts uh, to, to show Kohler. So there's a, there's a range of benefits to electroplating those pieces. And, and the one thing I wanna just, just emphasize here you don't have the ability to, to take it straight off the machine and then electroplate it. It does need to take the additional step of being coated in like a graphite paint to, to hold that charge. But again, it's a very straightforward step with regards to that. A lot of people are really starting to explore it. Uh, the next one up I really want to talk about, and I really kind of consider this a prototyping um, application here, but you know, the, the, the case study I want to talk about is Google's ATAP Lab. And again, this is their hardware invention studio over at Google. And uh, they're working on some really interesting projects, you know, where they brought Form Labs in and our high temp resin, 
was with regards to a wearable device. So this is a sub-electronic assembly, a very complex uh, molding process. Essentially, it's a molded and then over-molded part, and they needed to dial it in for production at a later stage. Um, so, you know, in terms of this device, again, it's like a wearable that you put in your jacket. So think about maybe, you know, like a Fitbit in your North Face. You know, that's what they're trying to get accomplished here. And uh, in order to, to really dial these in, these first articles for production, what they had to do was take them straight out of the, uh, the factory where they were made and bring them in-house and, and dial them in. And again, lots of money. Each one of these piece, pieces cost 100 bucks and took about three weeks to get back from that facility. So again, lots of time, lots of money wasted. And so what they wanted to do is develop a surrogate to fit that need without having to go to that facility to get those, those, those made pieces. And high temp resin was a terrific fit for what they wanted to get accomplished in terms of dial in those uh, first articles of production. So they took our high temp resin, which has a heat deflection temperature of close to 300 degrees Celsius. They, they were able to get the, uh, the very tight tolerances, the detail, for each one of these sub-electronic assemblies by using our high temp as a surrogate. And they're actually able to hit that at 20,000 PSI at about 260 degrees Celsius and really drive um, a quicker uh, production cycle. So what took three weeks now takes a day. What used to cost a hundred bucks now costs about 10 cents. And it really was a huge win for Google's ATAP lab. And, if you talk to the uh, the lab director over there, he's got a really interesting approach to 3D printing and just building things in general, right? You know, for him, he's not just prototyping at the initial stage of figuring out what they're going to create. He literally prototypes the entire workflow, right? So he thinks about every stage of the process and how he can iterate with regards to that process. So again, really interesting mindset in terms of how he approaches building things. Um, but again, high temp resin is one of our, our more exciting high high end engineering resins. Um, it's got a high heat deflection temperature. A lot of people are starting to do cavities and molds with uh, micro injection workflows. Um, so in terms of the heat deflection temperature, you know you're you're able to shoot any of the uh, standard ABS plastics and even some of the uh, low temperature alloys. So this is just an example of a, a print we did in house or a cavity and mold we did in house for. Uh, for the, um, the design that you see there, that's actually a cast in pewter. So again, great application. A lot of people are really starting to explore it here over at Form Labs with regards to our customers. Um, composite molding is another one for high temp resins. So uh, Delta Wing does a lot of performance vehicles on a lot of specific uh, component parts for those vehicles. So they wanted to do this uh, manifold. Um, originally the mold was being uh, milled on their CNC machine, they found out with regards to the tolerances on that high temp resin, they're able to get the same surface finish they're looking for. Um, and the same, you know, they're able to apply the same type of heat that they were applying uh, previously with that CNC part, and they got the same result. So essentially they're able to open up their, uh, their mill for other work and still get what they need to get accomplished with our high temp resin. Uh, next up is investment casting. So. Uh, this is a, a short case study we did with Ring Brothers out of, I believe it's Wisconsin, but this is a, a really, really well-known custom car shop that does a lot, you know, award-winning custom cars. And uh, they went to a lot of scrap yards. They went to a lot of different places to find the iconic uh, Cadillac symbol that you see on the, on the page there. And they could have just as easily, um, you know, milled this piece if they wanted to. The thing they were most concerned about and, and really couldn't get accomplished was the, the type of detail they were looking for. So um, they built it in, in, in the CAD that they were using at the time, printed it up in our castable wax material, and they actually went to a local caster and had it cast, um, which is what you see that finished part right there. And they were able to capture the exact details they were looking for while building this out. So again, uh, you know, I kind of jumped the gun here, but this is actually our castable wax resin. And, you know, traditionally it's been used in the, uh, the jewelry field, right? A lot of people um, use our castable wax for investment casting with jewelry and specific, um, you know, designs and rings. But a lot of people are starting to really uh, take that same resin and apply it to different manufacturing and in and, and use part workflows. So this is just one example there. Um, another example of how people are using our castable wax material is sand casting. So, um, in terms of what you see on the screen there, this is, this is just, uh, you know, the, the gentleman on the left, he's holding two pieces, one that was uh, built with our castable wax, which is in his left hand, 
And then in his right hand is the original piece that he created. So this is a company that does a lot of ergonomic wheelchair designs um, out of Japan. And in Japan, you have to have very tight, compact machines or, or wheelchairs to get around in you know, cities like Tokyo, right? So um, their original design uh, needed to be very strong, had very high tolerances in terms of strength. And so that is done in traditional manufacturing processes, way too heavy, uh, just didn't have the uh, battery life they needed based on the weight of that part. Still very strong, still got the job done, just too heavy. So they redesigned that part uh, in CAD, uh, printed it out in four different pieces in our castable wax, sand casted it, uh, are able to get the same tolerances in terms of strength, but with a piece that is about 35% lighter. So it really fits their, their demands in terms of battery life and not sucking down the battery on that uh, wheelchair. So again, just a couple of examples of how people are using our castable wax here. Next up is Ashley Furniture. So this is a case on you know uh, printed parts on the production workflow or on the, uh, in a production facility. So Ashley Furniture uses our, our machines 24 seven in their Arcadia facility. And again, just a quick kind of um, backdrop on Ashley Furniture. They're one of the uh, largest case goods manufacturers in the world. I think they do close to 300,000 pieces of furniture out of their Ar Arcadia facility every month. So again, lots, lots going on there with regards to um, just production. And uh, originally they, they took us on because they're looking to get away from milling alignment pins um, from their job shop. So they wanted to not have to go to their job shop to do alignment pins. It, they wanted to see if maybe a 3D printed alignment pin would work for them. And again, for us, it was a slam dunk. You know, not only was it a great fit, but what they found out was the longevity of that part was much, much longer than they expected. They were thinking three, three months with that 3D printed alignment pin, they actually got nine months out of those alignment pins. And that's when their engineers really got together and said, okay, what else can we do with these machines? And that's when they got really creative. This uh, picture on the, on the far left here is actually a changeover station based on 3D printed parts. It's got three different resins that you see there. You have our tough, which is that blue, um, our standard gray resin, which is uh, obviously the gray. <laughs> and then obviously you can see different uh, various resins in there. There's our durable. Um, I think they even have some of our elastic, if I'm not mistaken. But again, this changeover station is a universal changeover station, allows them to, to decrease the changeover by about half an hour. And it's all based on the color of that resin. So they're able to do three different changeovers with three different resins. This is a, about a five-step changeover based on the color of that resin. A couple other examples in terms of how they're using our product in their facility. You know, on the bottom right, you have a uh, uh, an air... Uh, essentially a manifold that's printed in our tough and then you have an al alignment tool on their tack gun there at the top i think that's just our standard resin so just in terms of how people are getting really creative ashley furniture really got in there they have about 400 printed parts in their facility in arcadia with the form labs machines so again they love the ease of use and again just another example of the versatility if you will um, next up, this is one that's really starting to take off for us, surface masking. And again, you, you know, just depending on the tolerances that you're looking for, a lot of folks are starting to use just our standard resins for surface masking application. And this originally came to the table with a high-end engineering firm that is doing a lot of work with regards to um, engine manufacturing and jet engine manufacturing, right? So in the past, you know, when they built these turbines for these, uh, these jet engines, um, they used to uh, mill specific plastic parts that they would they would snap on to obviously do the special coating they needed on those those turbines. And again, lots of money. These were all thrown away plastic parts from their CNC machines, so they're really tying up all their uh, all their mills, and of course, uh, spending a lot of money on you know throwaway plastic parts. They actually brought uh, Form Labs in because they had some very complex uh, masking applications in terms of. Uh, the, the complexity of those designs, and it was a real slam dunk for them. So they're able to get the surface masking they needed and really scale up with regards to, um, you know, the Form Labs machine over there. So can't go into specific details on who that organization is. I just want to show you guys some examples here. Again, surface masking is really starting to, to be explored by a lot of our customers. Um, Going off that point, you know, the next thing I really want to dig into is in use per production. You know, how people are using um, desktop machines to scale production in use parts. And the uh, the first example I always like to kind of touch on 
is what Gillette's doing with their Razor Maker program. So Razor Maker, you can go online right now, razormaker.com. Um, you can go onto that website. You can pick a specific customized design for 3D printing. Um, and you have about 48 plus designs to choose from, including an electroplated uh, or chromed out uh, customized handle. Um, you can print, you can uh, design, you can put your name on that handle. And this is really uh, Gillette's answer to Harry's. Harry's goes affordable. Razor Maker wanted to go um, customized, build you a, a very customized experience. And so in terms of what they, what, they, what they benefited from, right? They optimized all their parts for added manufacturing and maximized production yield. Um, but in terms of what Gillette's customers received in return was an unprecedented design experience, uh, most importantly, a bespoke experience based on what they wanted with regards to that 3D printed uh, razor. So again, you can go to that website, pick the, the design that you like the most, pay 25 bucks in about three weeks, you'll have a, uh, a 3D printed um, Gillette razor that was all printed on the Formalized machine. I think they have roughly 40 or 50 machines over there printing nonstop with regards to this program. They actually just launched a new design based on the Apollo space missions. That's really cool in terms of the design they've created. But definitely take a look. Again, these are all 3D printed on the Formlabs machines. Next up is New Balance. So this is um, this was a really exciting uh, application for us in terms of what they wanted to get, get accomplished. Not only did they want a, uh, a production design that could only be accomplished by additive manufacturing or 3D printing, but they also wanted to develop a customized uh, performance material. So if you think about you know, running shoes in general, a lot of them are created with just standard EDF foam, which is great with regards to, you know, it's, it's, you can manipulate it, you can cut it into whatever form or fashion you need. It's, it's got great cushioning. The real kind of takeaway or the reason why EDF foam is not great is how, what, how it performs over time. You know, it doesn't have great energy return. So as you run in those running shoes over time, they compress a lot more wear and tear. You got to go on to another pair of shoes. With our rebound risen, which we developed and you see on the screen there, this has terrific energy return. So that wear and tear is no longer an issue with regards to their 990 uh, series of uh, shoes. And they just launched two of these shoes with the Form Labs uh, print farm just this, just this year, right? One was the uh, 990S, which I believe is their lifestyle shoe. Short production run of about 500 pairs. I think they just uh, launched their uh, 990 Sport just recently, another 500 pairs. And again, so far it's been a terrific success. They're looking to scale that to about 10,000 pairs next year. So again, in terms of what they're able to get accomplished, um, they are able to get a custom high performance elastomeric resin um, and, you know, a, a performance material that was outperforming traditional athletic sneakers or that EDF foam. So again, they were really able to scale with a production solution and do it and, and build those in use parts that they needed. You know, the last example I really want to kind of touch on today is the uh, Form Labs print farm. And again, just, just in terms of some of the benefits, some of the, some of the uh, slides we've gone through already talking about, you know, what are the benefits or the advantages of modular production? These are all things that we learned ourselves in-house based on scaling up our own production facility. So again, in terms of what that facility looks like, it's one of the largest uh, desktop print farms in the world, roughly 250 Form 2s, 11 full-time employees, pumping out roughly 18,000 samples per month. In terms of those samples, um, runs the gambit, right? So if you go to our website, there's 23 different standard samples to choose from. Um, and all of those samples are actually printed in our Ohio print farm. So with us, we didn't sit down just one day and say, okay, we need 250 machines. This is something we really built up and dialed in as we grew this facility. So it took us about one and a half years to scale up to 250 machines. We scaled this up um, roughly about 10 to 15 machines per month, and we're really able to dial in those machines as we scale. So it really gives you, you know, a scalable solution. Um, and again, it's been our test bed for agile manufacturing over the last two years. We've really learned quite a bit in terms of building out this facility. And again, it is just prototyping, uh, you know, but in terms of what we're able to get accomplished, it has been substantial. So in terms of scaling out this, this lab and this facility, you know, not only have we scaled to 18,000 samples per month, you know, we've been able to enable higher value or more difficult samples that we couldn't create in the past. And we've also been able to reduce the labor per part by about 60% while increasing production fivefold. 
So again, just some of the benefits of scaling with a modular or desktop solution, you know, being able to, to, to really kind of test out and dial in what makes sense for your specific applications. Um, and with that said, I guess the last component I did want to touch on is what's really driving or what's the engine behind everything that you've seen today. And that is obviously the Form 3 and, um, you know, the Form Labs printers, right? So the Form 3 is something we just launched in uh, April this year. It's been an exciting piece of technology because it's a proprietary patented new technique with regards to SLA. It's called low force steel lithography. And, you know, if, if I look at kind of, you know, what the success has looked like, the Form 2, we put about 40,000 of those machines out in the world in about four to five years. We put 8,000 of these Form 3s out in the world in about eight months. So again, it's been really exciting in terms of what it brings to the table. This is just a quick rundown of what that looks like. You know, you get a high level of print success, uh, with our low force stereolithography in terms of part quality and just being able to put parts on that machine and they come out the next day successful. Uh, ease of use. So I touched on this when we first uh, presented today and that is, you know, ease of use is extended with this machine. Um, but again, easy support removal is another part of that. And again, 44% of users have little to no 3D printing experience. Versatility is another key component of what Formlabs brings to the table. We have 20 plus resins to choose from. And, you know, if I thought, you know, the Form 2 was a great material platform in terms of versatility, what low forest stereolithography brings to the table is exponentially greater. So I see us really expanding um, the versatility with resins and the resins we develop just based on low forest stereolithography uh, in general, right? In the past, there's only certain things we could create based on the Form 2 with the Form 3, it's really night and day. So it's gonna get quite aggressive with regards to the range of materials available. Um, the Form 3 is also great with regards to uptime. If uptime is a very crucial component, there's a tremendous amount of integrated sensors, a new heating system built into the uh, resin tray, you'll have the ability to, to remotely print so you don't have to babysit the machine. Um, and print failure detection is obviously part of that as well. And then of course, you know, the last component is a user replaceable RMA proof machine. So um, if you have any issues with regards to the optics or the LPU, it'll actually be user replaceable. We can just ship that out. So it's a, it's a very strong solution with regards to uptime and production, not to mention, you know, obviously print quality, part success and the ease of use. So with that said, you know, I want to kind of bring Lauren back into the equation here to talk a little bit more about EAC as well. All right, awesome. Thanks, Levi. Just wanted to reiterate the fact that EAC is a partner of Form Labs, and if you guys have any Form Labs needs um, relating to resin refill or questions or just being a general resource in regards to 3D printing, we're here to help. So definitely reach out if you have questions.